Okay, hi, Chefcast time. Chefcast time. Good Abend. Sorry. Willkommen aus Chefcast. That's afternoon, you dum dum. Good morning. There you go. Willkommen aus Chefcast. Uh, das Chefcast heute uh, ist uh, auch der Buchmark. Yeah. Yeah. How's my German those, so far? Those were all German words. Uh, did they make any sense at all? Maybe. I, it's not bad, I suppose. No, you've obviously got some uh, Lutheranism brushed off on you. It's around somewhere. somewhere. Uh, but one of the great things that Lutheranism brings you is being able to hear, read, mark, learn, and understand the scriptures in your own language, which mm. mine is not German. No. No. It's I'm, English. Yes, very much so. Uh, today, we are looking at the book of Job. Well, the first chapter, though, right? Because that's the only part of Job there is. Uh, wow. Job's a really long book. It's really long. Uh, Job is among the longer books that we have in all of Scripture, to be honest. Yeah. Well, which, again, anything that's over 40-something chapters. What is it, 42 chapters? Yeah, 42 chapters. Yeah. Anything that's over that is one of the longer books you've got. Like, yeah. obviously, Psalms is the longest one. But, but like, it's interesting. It's probably not for anyone else. But uh, looking at the structure of the Bible, you've got Job, you've got Psalms, you've got Proverbs, you've got Isaiah, like, all in and around the same area, right? Yeah. And they're all really long books. And to have them all, like, right in the middle of the Bible, essentially, yep. is, is interesting for It's me. great stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it's, and Job is a better book than you think it is, I suppose. It, it, yeah. You, give it more credit than you do, because you give it the it, credit. It goes into you. depths that we don't necessarily recognize, because, I mean, what we know of Job is the first part where he loses everything and he says, Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Thanks be to God. Yep. But then it goes deeper than that because you see how much he loses, how, uh, how much he is tempted, but also how much he is rewarded. And all of his dumb friends show up. Yeah. There's something else too. Hey. Yeah. Um, essentially the big question of Job is not just are you, are you only a fair weather friend vis-a-vis -vis God, but also uh, how capable is your human brain at, at understanding the work and, and the uh, machinations of God? Mm -hmm. and that, that's a fairly straightforward question because, of course, it's not... And, and what God gets... And we'll, we'll get into that shortly. Um, but what God gets into is not like your brain is too small to understand the workings of God, but rather that you lack the reference points to even mm -hmm. really properly discuss it because you are bound by temporality mm -hmm. and therefore as a being that is bound by matters temporal you will find it very difficult indeed to contemplate matters eternal mm -hmm. like um, we think about eternity as being this but longer but it doesn't really work that way because it, it's it's divorced from linear time altogether. Mm -hmm. So there, but we don't have any concept of anything. That's not related to time. That's not related to linear time, right? Mm -hmm. like, like linear time is like fourth dimension stuff where we can't really picture something like, like, like an existing thing that doesn't also exist in time and, right. the, and the normal time forward progression that we have. So for God to discuss it, he is going to have to say to Job, just so you know, if you want to talk about God and what God does, you've got to have some crazy frame of reference that you don't have. Yeah. All right, well, let's get into that now. All right, so Job chapter 38, verses 1 through 11. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you and make it known, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know, or who stretched the line upon it? Or what were its, on what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors, when it burst out from the womb, when I made clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed limits for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far you shall come, and no further. And here shall your proud waves be stayed. Is that it there? That's it. Yeah. I mean... I would love to keep going, but it really does just keep going. I, I know where it's going, obviously, yeah. um, but it's worth talking about it in isolation. Uh, that is to say that right now, God is telling Job, you want an answer for what happens to you, but 
I'm not sure that you're capable of even grappling with the enormity of what it means to be talking mm -hmm. to something that is outside of creation. Mm -hmm. Like you're stuck in creation. You are stuck in this created world. You are stuck in a world where the sun comes up and goes down and like you just accept these things as granted. You know, sun comes up, sun goes down. Uh, temperature gets warm, temperature gets cold. Uh, leaves sprout, leaves fall. And these are just things that you are born into as mm -hmm. people have been born to them for millions of years. And then you uh, live in that for a period of time and you don't ever have to question that because mm -hmm. you know that when it gets cold, winter's coming, when it gets warm, summer's right. coming. And that's really simple stuff. Mm -hmm. But with God, you're talking to the person who authored all of this and who prescribed, as it says, all the limits for it. Mm -hmm. God isolated what this was going to be and he said to you, this is outside of that jurisdiction. So knowing that, how are you going to be able to have a big, long conversation with God about it when you are tied to the world that exists? Right. Yeah. What I also love about this passage is that it reminds me that we have a God of sarcasm. Right? Oh, we do, don't we? Like when he says, who determined its measurements? Surely, Surely you, you know. know. Yeah. Like, and, and you see that in other places too, like God and Abraham, like count... Are your descendants will be as numerous as the stars in the sky if you can count them yeah, all. Count them if you can. And we see that coming up over and over again. And it smile it makes me smile to think of God as having a personality, yeah. right? He's not yeah. just, you know, some big dude in the sky, but he's a real being with a real personality as well. And it comes through in passages like this and yeah. makes me feel better about the amount of sarcasm I use as well. Uh, God, in his infinite wisdom, uh, communicates to Job in a way that Job needs to be communicated with, mm -hmm. where Job's finite brain is not going to wrap its head around the idea that God prescribed all these limits and that there, was, that there was anything outside of creation, outside of the universe, outside of all. Perhaps we could cover a little philosophical ground. Life, death, life, things of that nature. I did not have time on Vulcan to review the philosophical disciplines. Come on, Spock, it's me, McCoy. You really have gone where no man's gone before. Can't you tell me what it felt like? It would be impossible to discuss the subject without a common frame of reference. You're joking. A joke is a story with a humorous climax. You mean I have to die to discuss your insights on death? Uh, Job's brain can't work that out, so God is saying to him, okay, so if you want these answers in the way that you want them, then you tell me. You tell me where all this yeah. came from. If, if, you, if you think that you have this all figured out, you tell me how we got to this position. You tell me how it's working. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And also, I find that Job also gives us the permission to question God. Right? Because Job does ask the questions of God, like, why is this happening? Why this? Why this? And God answers him. Right? right? Like the beginning, it says, then the Lord answered Job. So it's not as though we can't ask our questions to God. It's not as though we can, we just have to stew with all the uncertainties we have. God welcomes us to bring our questions to him, but also, I suppose, warns us that the answers that he has aren't necessarily going to be the answers that we've already prescribed to him, right? The answers are going to be God's answers, not our answers, like through the God puppet. It's habitually dangerous to claim and, and to declare that God owes you an explanation for things. It's, mm -hmm. it's difficult and dangerous to do that, to say, God, you owe me an explanation right. as to why things are the way they are. He really doesn't. That's not the way this works, not really. Like the God, God's explanation for why things are happening are going to be that they're happening for, and like, I know it's kind of unsatisfying, but it's not once you realize who God is, then you mm -hmm. understand. Um, like if you were able to grapple with that, if you were able to, as a, as a cat, understand why your family was taking you to the vet, which you don't, mm -hmm. all you know is it's uncomfortable there and you don't like it. You don't get like your temperature taken or your shots or whatever. That's not nice. Of course it's not nice. It's very mm -hmm. unpleasant. But they do this so that you can survive right. and thrive and prosper uh, in a way that you would not be able to otherwise. It's straightforward enough where God says, 
you can't understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. And so all of the discussions where we start at the Lord's Prayer with a big, long declaration of the glory of God are partially there for that reason, where we can say, yes, this is who God is. This is who I'm talking to. This is why I'm talking to mm -hmm. him. I have problems, issues, concerns, needs, things like that. And I'm bringing those forward to God, and God is able to answer them and, and to deal with them. Um, because he is who he is. If he wasn't who he was, then he couldn't. Mm -hmm. But then the corollary for that is if this is the property of God, then it's also going to be the property of God when he's working with things that I don't quite understand. Right. Which is fine as long as you trust him to work all things for the good of those who love right. him. Yeah. Yeah. The whole thy will be done. Thy will be done. Which is a hard thing to pray. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Moving along to Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians 6, 1 through 13. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you. And in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech, and by the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise. We are treated as impostors, and yet are true, as unknown, and yet well-known, as dying, and behold, we live, as punished, and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children, widen your hearts also. Yeah. Probably widen that heart, huh? Widen that heart, yeah. your child. Yeah. Um, but this is such a clear representation of a Pauline writing where you mm -hmm. have just the huge chasm between the two, and yet they're being the same. When you have the. Um, uh, hold on, there we go. Uh, punished, not killed, sorrowful, always rejoicing, poor, making yeah. many rich, where you have mm -hmm. these two very different things, but both of them are treated as valuable and as equally uh, correct. Yeah. Um, I, I do like how it starts where it says, in a favorable time, I listened to you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Right. Yeah. The, right. like, uh, the, the time has come mm -hmm. uh, that everybody who is waiting for the promises of God to be fulfilled should understand that that has been done now. Mm -hmm. uh, that this is the favorable time. This is the day of salvation. Uh, this has come to pass, and therefore it should, it should by nature change how you and I and everybody else um, relate to God. Right. Um, not as one who is far off, but as one who is near. Well, as, and not that we're waiting for something else to happen, right? No. Like when it says it is the favorable time now, you're not waiting for a better time. Like um, the people that he's writing to were brought out of the Jewish faith, right? Where yep. they were waiting, they were waiting, they were waiting, and now the time is here. Do not keep waiting as you have been in the past. Uh, react, act now. They went through uh, hardships of every way, great endurance, and afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labor, sleepless nights, hunger by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love by truthful speech and the power of God. Um, that you have... The, the second things helping you to withstand the first. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And this is once again a, um, a reminder to anybody who might still be thinking that faith in God will naturally carry you through and you will not have any kind of trouble, opposition, problems, issues, concerns. Yeah. Um, you will, uh, because the disciples sure did. And if they did, why won't you? Yeah. Uh, that seems to be a pretty clear thing to be able to say to people that if their issues were such and they were that close to Christ, and you're just like uh, Josh Waterston from uh, Faith Lutheran Church, like, okay, so how are you 
deserving of being spared the hardships and calamities of life when the disciples weren't. Like they understood mm -hmm. that this was a guaranteed calamity, hardship, beatings, imprisonments, riots. This was this comes to the territory when you proclaim to the world that its ways are are not just corrupt, which they are, but they are coming to an end. Right. Uh, that's not a message that's very very popular, and therefore you are going to enter into troubles and problems. And your job is to be faithful through that and, and to understand that your faithfulness through that will carry you right the way through all these difficulties, difficulties and traumas and whatnot that are mm -hmm. expected. Right. Yeah. And I mean, you have the um, Lutheran doctrine of law and gospel being proclaimed in those passages as well, where you yeah. have the law, the things that you are subject to, right? Yep. The difficulties of the world. But what comes after that is the gospel message that God cares for you. He has sent his son for you and will provide for you. And just as we saw with Job, it's not necessarily in a way you can understand. It's not necessarily through the means you would have chosen, because I'm certain nobody would have chosen the hardships, the beatings, the riots, the hunger, right? Yep. But when you have the means of God through the patience, Holy Spirit, the genuine love, the truthful speech, the power of God, yep. those are the things that we trust in um, and that have saved us. Terrific, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Should we roll along yeah. to the gospel reading? Absolutely. Uh, so All right. it's, a, it's a brief little ditty yep. from Mark chapter 4, 35 through 41. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other, other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is another one of those passages that has a, a tiny, pointless detail that never comes up anywhere else, and you would only include as a reference if you were recounting a thing that actually happened, where it says, he was in the boat just as he was, and other boats were with him. Mm -hmm. Now, you could, if you wanted to, cut that sentence out completely, mm -hmm. and it would not improve nor harm the story in the slightest. The story of Jesus calming the sea is not affected by the presence of those other boats with him. That's irrelevant, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter because those people in those other boats... Never mentioned again. Yeah, it doesn't matter, right? Like, it, who cares? Uh, they don't come up ever again unless you're recounting something that actually happened, right. as you recalled it. Unless you said, okay, so we went out into this boat. Jesus was there just as he was. He was asleep on the cushion, and there were a lot of other boats with us. Yeah. And those other boats would have been people who would have been at least somewhat interested in what happened to calm that sea down so quickly. They weren't on the boat with Jesus, you understand. They were on other boats. So they wouldn't have known for sure, for sure, what was going on unless they talked to people after the fact right. and found out what, what had happened. They right. would have been witnesses to a miracle. Um, but they are not directly included. But like this is part of how the, the story of Jesus spreads and spreads as rapidly as it does because there are multiple witnesses who would say things like, yeah, I was on the sea that day too. Yeah, I was I, one of those other boats. I was on one of those other boats. It's a nice little detail that helps you to understand that these are things that are written for a reason, for a purpose, yes, but also are transcriptions of actual events that really mm -hmm. happened. Yeah. Because that's the sort of event or the sort of detail that you would only have in a story if mm -hmm. it actually happened. Because most of our stories have all kinds of pointless details like this in which the details do not add to the story. They could easily be dropped off. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I like most is when you see like a couple talking mm. and um, like he's telling a story and she'll correct him on like what color a dog was or whatever. Right. And like, it doesn't matter to the story at all. Not one bit. The, the, like the color of the dog in question is irrelevant. Nobody else cares, right? If you're listening to the story about how they went to Rome and saw a yellow dog. The father replies, guess Rome was a place where we saw the yellow dog. <laughs> well, actually, it was a black dog. There you go, yeah. right? Exactly like that. Um, in that case, the nature of the dog is irrelevant. 
But people will correct each other on those details because those are details that they remember mm -hmm. from being there, even though they're irrelevant details. Yep. When Jesus bends down and draws in the sand, when they mention that there's other boats with them, stuff like that, you're like, wait a minute, this is only stuff you'd include as eyewitness stuff. Well, and it also um, makes it more of a tale of reality rather than a tale of fiction. Because like if you have a movie, right? Yeah. And the movie, let's say the movie is called Jesus, Man of the Sea, yeah, right? Yeah, sure. So you have that he's teaching in a crowd, but then he goes off in a boat. You don't care anything about the rest of them, so you don't provide any details about anything else that happened. But looking at the um, story here, there is a crowd that was surrounding him that yeah. was very interested in yeah. what he had to say. So if Jesus goes off on a boat... What is happening to the crowd? Are they just staying there? No, they're invested enough that they are going to go with him in the boats that they have there too. So it really provides a sense of completion in the story too, mm. where it's not just Jesus, but it's Jesus and everything else that was happening there too. And as you say, those details aren't necessarily important for the main focus of the story, but yep. it helps us to be grounded in reality to see that these are people acting in a people way. Which they would be, and which they did because they're real people. Mm -hmm. And now this story, of course, is in here because it is related to the story from the Old Testament, the, mm -hmm. the account there of Job talking to God, where God says to Job, who was it who set the limits for the wind and the waves? Tell me if you know. Mm -hmm. Who was it that prescribed their, their uh, advance and said, thus far you shall come and no further? Uh, we're still in an age, I mean, like we got a lot of book smarts, but we're still in an age in which the, if the water feels like showing up, it's going to show up. Right. There's not much you can do about it. Well, and I mean, like, um, sailing I don't have as much experience with, but you think of flying, right? Yep. And how even though we're at the age we have the technological advancements available to us, if there is a windstorm, that plane isn't going anywhere. Right. If the, the weather is inclement, you're not going. There are things that are outside of your control, things that you can try and push through and power through. And we're used to the weather not determining too much. Like, like unlike in years past, if it's really cold outside, you like really hustle your buns out to the car and then drive to mm -hmm. where you're going, then hustle your buns inside, and then it's like pretty much this temperature inside yeah. no matter what. But even then, you can't modify that weather. It would if you could. Right. So when Jesus rebukes the storm, and commands it to be still, and it is, he is demonstrating authority and mastery over something that God discussed was entirely his province back in the uh, Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And anybody else who has since said, I am going to then command the seas to do what I want, like King Canute way back in the day. So Canute is most famous for commanding the tide to stop crashing on the shores of England. For this, he's often portrayed as being a bit mad, but in fact it was a pious act and was to show that even a king's power pales in comparison to God's. No, uh, you are not able to. You can rebuke the sea all you want. You can tell it to go back all you want. Only God is able to display that kind of mastery, which is why they're so concerned. They're filled with mm -hmm. great fear and said to one another, who then is this? Yeah. That even the wind and seas obey him. This is not a standard carpenter, surely. No. Well, and it's not even a standard rabbi. Like, they were no. likely gathered around for his teaching. Well, we know they were from, like, the way where it said later on that same yeah. day. And we just finished the mustard seed stuff. Right. And, I yeah. mean, that's the point I'm making is that they were gathered for his teachings, not mm -hmm. for his miracles. Right? right. But he showed that not only does he have a mastery of understanding, but he has a mastery of abilities as well. He speaks as one who had authority. And here when he rebukes the wind and the waves, he is still speaking as one who has authority over these things, as in he is the author of creation, therefore he can do what he likes with mm -hmm. it. It's his. He can do that. The sea is his for he made it. The sea is his for he made it, right? He can say to the sea, stop it, mm -hmm. and the sea will stop. He can say, storm be still, and it will be still. Because he has that kind of command over it in a way that nobody else does. Mm -hmm. Everybody else would have to hide, take cover, row to shore, whatever. Mm -hmm. Only Christ is able to say, stop, mm -hmm. and have it all stop. Yeah. All right. Uh, anything further? No. Nope. All right. Uh, then let us say a word of prayer and, and conclude our Shepcast for today. 
Heavenly Lord, we thank you for showing exactly who you are throughout the scriptures, that uh, when Job asks for understanding and clarity and God responds by saying, essentially it is him that controls the wind and the waves, that when Jesus shows up and does even that, that we are not so much filled with great fear right now, but with great joy, because that is the person who elected to take the sins of the world upon himself and die on our behalf. We thank you for providing us with his salvation. We thank you for showing us his grace, his mercy, and his joy. We ask you to keep us uh, through that same faith uh, throughout all of our days of pilgrimage, that you provide us with all of our needs and you show us your truth. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us on our cast. We'll catch you on our next ChefCast. See you then.